So I'm going to start with the recording. Okay. So tonight uh, is, again, our weekly drop-in session. I don't think I like my glasses there. They've got the reflection. Give me a second. I'll see if I have uh, No, I probably don't need one anyway. Okay. So I've, I've started the recording. Uh, during the drop-in session, you're actually free to uh, ask any question you'd like about the uh, constitutional law topics we've discussed. Although I won't be able to provide any guidance as to any of the specific questions pertaining to the assessments. But other than that, you know, feel free to send me any, uh, ask me a question. So I'll give the floor to you now. Would there be anything you'd like to discuss? I'm just going to mute everyone. And then if you want to say something, please unmute yourself. I'll ask you for your thoughts on a few matters. Sure. I uh, was able to get my hands on an original copy of the Constitution. It's okay. just over a thousand pages long. It's got mm -hmm. all the uh, notes and comments when it was written. It's very, very interesting reading. Yes. I heard today that people say the Constitution's outdated and it doesn't really matter anymore, but uh, realistically, it's still got a lot of force behind everything. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, did you want me to give a comment on that? Yeah, it just, yeah, maybe. Uh, well, what we need to remember in the first place is that the Constitution, the Constitution is the fundamental law of the land. So regardless of whatever our views are, it is the supreme law uh, in Australia. And per perhaps uh, some of the comments relate to what others may perceive uh, to be very outdated notions or views within the Constitution itself. Like, for instance, uh, it wasn't around until the 1960s that the uh, Aboriginals in Australia had the right to vote because previous to that, uh, it was given to the states to determine whether or not the Aboriginals, uh, the, the Indigenous people in Australia actually had the right to vote. So it was left to the states. So it might be said, obviously, that uh, the framers of the Constitution in the late 1818, 18, uh, in the late uh, how do you call the 1800s or towards the early part of uh, the 1900s obviously had a, a different view of how the Australian society should be but uh, so it does make sense that uh, there will be uh, ideas within the constitution which may not which may appear to a lot of people to be uh, to be outdated but at the end of the day, it raises a very strong legal question, primarily in terms of how to interpret the Constitution. So, for example, when it comes to defense and national security, should uh, the Constitution be interpreted in light of how the framers of the Constitution drafted the Constitution, or should it be interpreted to actually uh, be more responsive to current events? So, in, for example, would it be permissible to uh, diminish the rights and freedoms and liberties of people for the sake of ensuring the safety of the rest of Australian society. So these are some of the legal questions. And I think we covered this in the, in the first week of the term when we said that uh, the constitution can be viewed as a living document, but notwithstanding uh, the idea that the constitution as a living document should not be understood and interpreted as a fossilized document or an ossified document, that uh, does not change, the idea being that there should be room to reinterpret to suit the needs of society, the fact remains that the High Court, uh, more often than not, actually uh, uses a very uh, strict textual approach towards interpreting the Constitution. And this is the reason why, as we later on see, the, the uh, High Court said that uh, it was, it, that any power that has not, for example, been uh, that, that in relation, for example, to the engineer's case, as uh, we, we later on see, the High Court had a very strict interpretation of the Constitution, so that uh, it said that um, it was in relation to the division of the powers between the states and the Commonwealth Parliaments. Uh, the High Court was was clear in saying that um, if it, it was not prepared to ha imply any limitation, for example, on the power of the Commonwealth to legislate, so that for as long as uh, it could be said that uh, it was within one of the heads of power 
uh, uh, in relation to Section 51 of the Constitution, even if it meant that it diminished what would otherwise have uh, been understood to exclusively pertain to the states, then the High Court said that it was unwilling to, uh, to interpret it in such a way. So what, what had occurred was that, um, for example, by using the, the power of defense or uh, the head of power in relation to security, this enabled the Commonwealth Parliament to step into areas uh, which otherwise belong to, to the state. So for example, if education uh, is not among the heads of power that belong to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the states, if by citing the need for security or citing the need for um, national defense, the Commonwealth Parliament then legislated also in relation to education, that would be considered permissible uh, under the engineer's case. Because uh, the, 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 view, the view of the High Court was that uh, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be uh, any limitation uh, that should be read. So the, the High Court then adopted a very uh, strict interpretation of the Constitution. I hope that answered your question. Uh, where was that? Yeah, now it was just more of a, a comment. I think um, somebody's put a question up there in the chat for you, though, Manjo. Uh, that's, this is quite a long uh, question here. Uh, Monique, Monique, would you like to pick up the mic? It, it might be easier instead of uh, me having to go through the bottom of the there. Sure, I'm here. I just, I've got Peppa Pig playing in the background. Um, and <laughs> I'm the same with my daughter as well. <laughs> babysitting my kids. So, um, all right, so I posted a question in Moodle today. Yes. Um, the question relates to quiz four, option D. And I am just seeking a bit of clarification. You may or may not be able to answer. Yeah. But my question is, um, does the condition mean that the conditions, sorry, does on the condition as worded in option D mean that the conditions mentioned in option D are the only conditions or just two of what may be other conditions. It sort of makes more sense when I write it down. If you did want to have a really quick look, I've copy and pasted my question into the chat. It, um, yeah, it, it might be better if you actually, if actually uh, read for us the question because I, okay. I can't remember how I wrote Sure. It. Okay, so... Option D states, the amendment is constitutional on the condition that the designation is with the consent of the respective judges and in their personal capacity. So option D presents two, you know, two conditions, you know, consent and personal capacity. Yes. What I'm just wanting to clarify, can you please stop that? What I'm wanting to clarify is whether those two conditions in option D yeah. need to be considered for that answer yes. as the only conditions or whether they need to be considered in light of other conditions. Ah, I see what you mean. Yeah. I, I, Thank I, you. I, Sorry. I, I understand what you're driving at. Um, yeah. Uh, you're, you're actually saying whether or not you should also include the question about ensuring that, uh, again, without providing the answers, uh, ensuring that the judges in general, uh, without again talking about the other conditions, uh, are actually holding uh, such designation in a non-compatible in a non-compatible way. So we have what is known as the incompatibility condition. Uh, we just so. We just assume that if they were to undertake the, the functions according to the designation, they will do it without becoming instruments of the executive or of the Commonwealth Parliament. So they're doing it independently. So we make that assumption. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I lost you, Monique. Okay, so we are assuming that, um, uh, I don't, am I, I'm allowed to say it, I guess you're not allowed to answer it, but if I say, you may not be able to answer this, but so we're assuming when we answer this question that there's no incompatibility yes. between the role that the judges are undertaking and their role as, 
undertaking in in a personal sense compared yeah. to or in line with their role as judges of chapter three courts. That's right. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Uh, Manjo, is, yes, there any difference, is there any difference between procedural fairness yeah. and natural justice? Uh, there is because um, the High Court, uh, according to Justice Mason in one case, I think in Keogh versus West, uh, made the suggestion that the better concept to use is actually procedural uh, fairness as opposed to natural justice. So he made a he made a uh, he made an argument in Keogh versus West that. that a distinction could be made between natural justice and uh, procedural fairness. I don't think we need to go into the details, except to say that at the end of the day, what they con the content of those two concepts are actually one and the same. So there are two aspects to both procedural fairness and natural justice. Uh, one is that there, there is a need uh, to be given a fair hearing to anyone whose rights are impaired or affected or interfered with by the state, not only his rights, but those who have a legitimate interest or legitimate expectation. So there is a right to a hearing to be, to be, to be heard. Uh, the second aspect is that uh, there is a requirement that whoever makes a determination in relation to the rights, legitimate expectations or interests of a person uh, should be free from bias. So, in other words, there's a need that that person, the judge, uh, must make sure that he is independent or she is independent. So those are the uh, two uh, important attributes of what are known as uh, of what is known as procedural fairness, which is very similar to the notion of natural justice. So it used to be that natural justice was the the all embracing term, but as he he argued. Uh, he raises questions as to whether or not, for example, not, it should be treated as justice that is natural, as opposed to the idea that uh, in, a, in a civil society where there is, you know, we, we understand that there are certain rights and freedoms of people, we understand that there, as, as a matter of constitutional practice, there should be procedural fairness. But again, in terms of the content, uh, we don't have to concern ourselves uh, with, about the particular distinction between natural justice and procedural fairness because in many cases, they are actually interchangeable. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Manjo, I got one. Yes, Anthony. Um, okay, in relation to uh, Section 116, mm -hmm. okay, I'm just, um, um, there's about nine or so cases that relate to, uh, that have been designated around that section. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what is probably the best case to, to take a look at that. Do, do you know off the top of your head? There's a, there's a, a few there. Yep. Is there any reason why you'd like to ask about the freedom of religion at this point? Uh, I'm just looking at whether whether it's it's been taken as a broad approach or whether as a narrow approach around religion. Um, I, I would really rather discuss constitutional rights and freedoms if it's all right. I think in week 11, because yep. I've had um, concerns or even complaints from students in the past when I tended to answer questions that hadn't been covered yet. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so if it's all right, I'd like to. So I, I, I recognize that as a valid answer, but if, it, if it's all right, because it's going to be taken up in week 11, I'd rather address that question in week 11. Yeah, oh, okay. If that's all right. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I won't go chasing it then because I was looking at uh, something around that as well. But okay. that's okay. That's probably answered my second question. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, no worries. Thank you. Other questions, comments? We've got a uh, link here from Jason. 
Uh, it's just a uh, case that Anthony might be interested uh, in okay. about one section 116, a recent one. Okay, so. very good. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Questions? Um, man, Joe, can I ask a question? Uh -huh. um, another one. I get that um, if a matter is uh, brought before an administrative process, you know, such as an administrative tribunal, um, and it's not a Chapter 3 court, mm. um, that obviously the rules are slightly more lax. So, therefore, if things... Um, if... Um, it's not completely following the way that um, a court would run things or procedurally. Um, where are the, where would you appeal such a, a matter though? How would you, if things are not expected to be run in such a way, mm. um, so you're not actually appealing the decision based on that it wasn't run in, in that certain way, what would you then be appealing the decision on? Okay. so. Let me begin by um, pointing out something in relation to the use of the word matter. In fact, um, administrative tribunals, which obviously are not chapter three courts, but they belong to the executive, do not have any jurisdiction in relation to matter. In fact, if an administrative tribunal were vested the jurisdiction to determine uh, matters, that would be unconstitutional according to the Boilermakers case. So uh, matter has been defined by Hadard Parker versus Moorhead as involving an actual controversy between individuals or between individuals and the states, uh, where uh, in, in relation to their rights uh, or their liabilities or their legitimate expectations. So only federal courts actually have jurisdiction uh, in relation to matter. So let's just clarify the use of the matter there. So there is a very restrictive meaning uh, in relation to the concept of matter. So only uh, federal courts have jurisdiction in relation to matter and um, administrative tribunals cannot have any jurisdiction to, to a matter. Now, wh what I think you, you were saying actually is that assuming that there is an application, for example, for review of a decision uh, by an administrative agency and that has been brought before uh, the an administrative tribunal. So this is not a matter. In other words, there is no actual controversy because what happens is there is an individual whose rights or legitimate expectations or interests have been affected or interfered with or impaired by a decision of an administrative agency or of an executive agency. This individual then brings an application, for example, before the administrative appeals tribunal. So we're talking here at the level of the Commonwealth, not at the level of the states. So that is the way that I understand the question. So on the assumption that when the administrative agency uh, made a decision, so not the administrative tribunal, but the administrative agencies, for example, such as Centrelink or the Department of uh, Immigration, for example. So any of these executive agencies, we assume, would have made a decision on the basis of an enactment. So an enactment can be defined as a statute passed by the Commonwealth or a regulation on the basis of an enactment coming from the Commonwealth. So assuming that uh, such an executive or an administrative decision was made that affected the rights or interests or legitimate expectations of an individual, on the assumption as well that the law on which the, de the administ administrative decision had been made also provides for an application for review of that decision to be made with the administrative appeals tribunal, so we make those two assumptions, then only then can the administrative appeals tribunal actually have jurisdiction over uh, the application for review. Now, your question was, assuming that the, either the, uh, uh, assuming that the administrative agency or the original decision maker did not observe the rules of natural justice or did not observe the rules of procedural fairness, the question is, uh, can that question be brought before the administrative appeals tribunal or should it properly be brought before uh, the courts? So either way you can do this. Uh, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Commonwealth provides that uh, under Section 6, that one of the grounds for judicial review under the ADGR Act is actually the failure to observe procedural justice 
or procedural fairness. Uh, there is also nothing in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975 Commonwealth which would prevent the AAT from reviewing an administrative decision on the basis, uh, on the ground that the original decision maker failed to observe procedural fairness as well. So would that answer your question? Without me going into administrative law, because that can get confusing at this point. It's quite a, a, a big topic. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks. Mm. Other questions? Are you able to talk about the structure of the final assessment at all? I know we're a fair way away, but whether, you know, what kind of um, format it'll take and how long you expect it to take us and things like that? Uh, uh, I can't remember what I stated in the unit profile, but I would imagine that given that the uh, final assessment, I think, comprises 50% of the grades, I think I say, stated in the unit profile that there will be five problem-based questions. So the questions that will be asked in the final assessment will be similar to the kind of questions that were asked in the in the midterm assessments. Now, those questions uh, are designed to be answered within a period of three hours. Had you had a student had to take a test in an invigilated scenario? So which means therefore that because I allocated 48 hours to the uh, to, uh, allocated 48 hours for students, to submit their answers, there is actu there's actually plenty of time for students to, you know, answer the, the questions thoroughly and accurately. So they're meant to be answered within three hours, but I've allocated 48 hours because I perceive that there will be students who will be uh, having concerns because of work commitments or it could, could be because of um, some other final assessment that they're doing at about the same time. five questions what kind of um like word limit if we're going by the midterm uh, around 500 there won't be any word limit. Okay. there is no word limit there is not even any uh expected requirement in terms of the minimum word count so we don't have a maximum word count limit like we do now and neither is there going to be an expected minimum word count limit so I leave it to the student because it's only a four hour, four eight hour uh, assessment. So in the same way that if it were to be an invigilated exam, there won't be any requirement as to the number of words. There won't be any, either in terms of the minimum or the maximum number of words. Uh, what is important, obviously, though, is that uh, any student that comes up with an answer should be able to answer the questions adequately. Since so, we're talking about that, Manjo, um, yes. In the, uh, a, a typical exam, you wouldn't uh, be too strict with referencing. What are your thoughts on that, given that we do have 48 hours? Good point. Uh, that's a good point. The assumption here is that there should be reference. Okay, there are two aspects to referencing. The first aspect re re refers to whether or not you cited sources for your answer. The second relates to the formal referencing in the sense that are you following AGLC? referencing rules. My expectation would be that students should be able to cite sources still because 48 hours is a lot of time and it is obviously open books because students have access to the book, to the textbook and to all other resources. I can't see a reason why within the period of 48 hours, students should not be able to cite uh, sources to support uh, their arguments or for them to cite whatever the rule might be. But I will, let, I, I will be less strict in relation to uh, referencing into the AGLC referencing, but there certainly should be a uh, citation of uh, sources. Other questions? How are, how are you all doing with the uh, midterm assessments? especially in relation to the individual assessment, which is already due next week on Friday. You're doing well with that? 
Yeah, it's all good, Manjo. Can I just ask, though, um, yeah. because I quite like the notes that you've provided, uh -huh. uh, I know we've been told in other courses we shouldn't really um, use notes, but um, I have used some of it. So I've just footnoted it by saying notes from Central Queensland University, Constitutional Law 2017. Yeah, it's a good thing you raised that, Erin, and this is really, really crucial. Uh, you cannot... The, the, the notes, the study guides should not be used as sources because um, you, you can use the content within, the, within the, the study guide. So if I cite cases, if I cite the law, then you should be citing those, but you shouldn't be citing the study guide itself because the, the study guide essentially does two things. One is the study guide provides uh, perhaps the important uh, laws or concepts pertaining to a particular topic. But in doing so, what I have done is actually to cite the, the important sources. So it could be case law that I'm citing or some other textbook author, or it could be a particular law. So those are the sources you should be referencing. The other aspect to the study guide is that sometimes it represents my own ideas. The problem, however, is that uh, in, in the academe, when we cite, when we cite the, the ideas of an author, this is usually in the context of a, of a journal manuscript, or it could be a conference paper, or it could be a textbook. But in personal opinions, because so in other words, mine would just be considered as a personal opinion, which hasn't really been formally submitted. So study guides then in that case shouldn't be uh, used as a, as, a, as a source. So the, the key sources that students would typically use, the most important would, of course, be the Constitution. Uh, the second would be statutes. Uh, third would be high court decisions. Fourth would be decisions of the lower courts, such as the Federal Court of Australia. Uh, then you can use uh, textbooks of authors. You can also use journal articles, but not study guides. So if you've been using them, don't, because they're not uh, suitable as uh, sources for assessments but you can you can use the the ones that i've cited within the study guide itself so it could be the boiler maker's case so you cite the boiler maker's case but not footnote the study guide itself that's a very good point that you've raised at least uh yeah so that should be fair warning to the other students as well that study guides should not be used as references in the assessments yeah, I've just noticed in um, some of your materials in the study guide, mm -hmm. it's uh, very close to what's in the textbook. So I'm assuming uh, that we need to go back and reword that in our own words and then footnote the text. Is that correct? That's correct. So uh, you have to cite the source that I cited. Other questions? Uh, I think I also answered uh, in the forum that students are actually free to discuss uh, answers to any of the midterm assessment questions. For as long as you don't end up uh, copying each other's answers in the final submission. But for the purpose of discussing anything in Moodle, uh, it should be fine because I got the confirmation from Learning and Teaching Services. In fact, I think it's quite, uh, it is suggested for students to have this discussion. But at the end of the day, when they come up with a written answer, they shouldn't be copying off each other's answers. But you can certainly have a discussion in Moodle for as long as I don't participate in uh, trying to provide any answer to the midterm assessments. Other questions? Um, Manjo, do you have any um, suggestions mm -hmm. um, about the group um, assignment? If um, it's if it's being if it's quite difficult to get um, different people to participate, and you've done emails and you've done um, phone calls and and that sort of thing, what how what other things can you try? And they're not responding. 
Um, yeah, so sometimes responding and saying that something will be done within a certain time, but then it doesn't get done and sometimes just completely not responding at all. Mm. My, my, my suggestion is, and from my observation, somebody typically within a group would, would really be more involved in the assessment tasks. It could be you, for example, Kathleen. And so in, in my view, what you could probably do is to, you know, just tell the your other group mates that, you know, for, for you to solicit their feedback, for you to have meetings, and if beyond a certain time something needs to be done, uh, hang on, I, I just need to turn up to close my fridge. Give me a second. Okay, so if something needs to be done, in other words, you, you have to come up with a written answer, you could probably inform your other group mates that you will initiate the process of uh, providing an answer. And, you know, within a certain period of time, you email off uh, your suggested answer and uh, get feedback from, your, uh, from, the from the other members of your group. Now, it should be noted in relation to this, that there should only be one written answer from each group. And what it also means is that because the, the mark for the group assessment will be, will be the same for all group members, we will assume that even those students who are less involved will have the same mark as the other student who's actually put in more effort. So all the students in the group will have the same mark for the group assessment. Now, what I said was that one of the students, some of the students may actually be less involved. It doesn't mean that the student, some student is actually uninvolved. So if there is a student who's done nothing, who's contributed nothing, that student will not get any mark for the group assessment. So the assumption is for as long as students have contributed, even in a small way, to the group assessments, and that is kind of a very broad and a vague uh, description, then all the students in the same group will have the same marks. But if there is a student who has not participated at all and who has not contributed at all, then that student will not get any mark for the group assessment. Does that answer your question, Kathleen? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. I'm just, um, because if you're the person who's sort of initiating it and the other people of the group also feel that, um, you know, some member is not participating at all mm. you're sort of constantly trying to try again and, and feel their disappointment as well as your own i suppose um, so it puts a bit that, that, is, on you. that is common uh in uh group settings but uh that, that, that's the reason why there is a there is a suggestion that we try to build into the unit some group assessment work really for students to feel what it is like to be working in a group setting. And in a group setting, not everyone puts in the same amount of effort and nor would the quality of their effort be the same. So you're being exposed to what it will be in real life. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of you have experienced uh, when you work in a company, you will have to be working with others. And the people you're working with are unlikely to have the same work ethics as you or the quality of, uh, their skills may not be comparable to yours. And yet you have got to learn to work with them anyway. I'm just having a look at a comment here, a question from Sarah. In week 4A study guide, there is mention of quasi-judicial powers and how this practice has been sanctioned by the High Court. Are you able to please direct me to a case where this has occurred? I would love to read it so I can understand quasi-judicial powers. Okay, um, Sarah, don't my notes have it, have this there? Because I think I, they're there. Uh, I've actually cited cases where the high court has, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so Jason has to go. Okay, see you on Thursday, Jason. So Sarah, kind of have a look at the study guide because the cases should be there. I can't think of it at the top of my head right now. Other questions or comments? 
Amanda, you were talking about the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act earlier in response to a question. Yes. Um, I asked earlier on in one of the drop-ins, and I just want to confirm again, mm -hmm. when we are answering the assessment questions, yes. is it correct that you do not want us to explore the specifics of other acts or how they relate to the question? Is that right? Uh, that's right. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, in relation to one of the assessment questions, you shouldn't really have to be exploring the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 common law. There is a basic uh, constitutional law principle that's related to that, and that is the only concept that you should be, or the principle that you should be, should be addressing. You shouldn't really go into administrative law. Oh, so was that clear? In relation to one of the questions, there is a constitutional law they mentioned there that will help you in answering the question. And in doing so, you don't really have to get into administrative law. And you don't really have to look into the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. In fact, you shouldn't. You shouldn't even be looking at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975 Commonwealth. There is a constitutional law they mentioned there. And that is all you need to address. That's right. So uh, the Albaran case uh, is one of those that uh, would relate to uh, the issue about quasi judicial powers. And I think that's, uh, according to Rin, and that's, I think that's in the study guide number four of the unit. It might be five, Manjo. Let me just check. Oh, I can't really remember. Yeah, week five. Week five, okay, so it's in week five. Okay, very good, thanks. Other questions? So we're good? Okay, if you happen to have any other questions, please feel free to send me an email or preferably post it in Moodle uh, if it's a question that might be of relevance to other students. And so I guess with that, you know, we're, we're going to have a session tomorrow anyway. Feel free to ask your questions there as well. So uh, good night, everyone, and thanks for joining tonight's session. And I hope to see you again tomorrow night. Good night. Bye.